So, good afternoon after the lunch break and I hope you all had a nice meal and um, we are back and it is my great pleasure, of course, uh, to introduce Ian Prey to you, who will be our next, oh, speaker is a funny word, our next person we talk to, <laughs> the, the next person. Um, who will contribute to this conference and um, I think Ian is kind of a remarkable earth activist. Um, I was fascinated by the combination of him being a Quaker and also being one of the co-founders of XR so having been there very early on when the movement started and also because he was one of the seven uh, people arrested, the seven shell activists basically, uh, arrested for criminal damage to the shell building in London and then consequently or not consequently afterwards basically acquitted uh, by a jury. And this case made, of course, headlines. Now we have moved on from there and we know now the Highway 9 and uh, are spending time in prison. Um, yesterday we spoke to, or we had uh, the pleasure to have three uh, HS2 activists here, young activists, who were also uh, acquitted uh, to, from the tree sisters protecting that oak tree and so there's a mixed bag it seems at the moment uh, in, within the justice system but when uh, Ian and the cell sh Shell 7 were acquitted that was of course well we were joyful when I spoke to Ian he wasn't quite sure but we talk about that later maybe um, so that Ian is one of the uh, Shell 7 was another reason that we felt uh, it would be really great to have him here. But mainly because the conference, as you have spotted so far, um, is in a way about how we combine the spiritual with activism and how our spiritual spiritual is a funny word, maybe faith, how our beliefs underpin what we are doing or how what we are doing are based on those and that's why we thought it would be interesting to have a conversation with you Ian about that. And before uh, we start talking I want to quote you to yourself if you don't mind. <laughs> I know, this is the moment we all hide. <laughs> and you said in an article I read, <laughs> I'm much more afraid of climate change than I am of arrest or going to jail. And to use some Quaker terms, here comes the quote, I hope I have lived adventurally enough to speak a small amount of truth to power and that my body has stopped the wheels turning just long enough for us to be here. And of course you can hide now but this is of course a very very touching quote because I feel quite a few of us might not have been able to express it that eloquently but kind of feel that that we want to make a different and difference and to speak a small amount of truth to power and as we are in a body this is how we can do it and you did it with the shell action in a way and I guess other actions. So and here comes of course the first idea. Is there anything you would like to add to what I have said about you 
or shall we just go into a conversation? Um, I think you've, you've said enough. I don't need to gild my lily anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hey, I am, and like everybody else here, I'm quite sure, are kind of curious um, how you turned in a way from a peace activist, because I think that's where it started, didn't it? Which is, yeah. because I've met a few Quakers, I've been with Quakers in Uganda and also uh, I know Quakers uh, who are active in Palestine and in um, and where in Gaza, when one still could get in there somehow. And a lot of them see themselves and are peace activists. And it seems you started there as well. And then how did you get to climate or to become more of a climate activist or both? <sighs> I think it was uh, processes running in parallel. Right. I started becoming aware of kind of ecological issues uh, probably 10, 11 years ago now. Um, I became a Quaker or started consulting with Quakers about six years ago. And my introduction actually to activism, you know, actually realizing it was possible and I could do it um, was through Quakers and the peace movement. Um, some people in our meeting are very active, um, you know, around fast lane and uh, anti-nuclear work. Um, and I found myself doing that work and I see the environmental stuff as, you know, it's primarily centered around justice. I'm not a carbon fundamentalist. Mm. Um, so in reality, there's no line you could draw between peace work and, and, and environmental justice work. Um, frequently, you know, the war and the military, you know, the military industrial complex, uh, you know, is feeding the ecological crisis. Um, so, you know, it'd be hard actually to put a divide between the two anyway, if you were asked to, I think. Absolutely. No, I agree with you. And I mean, we, we more and more, um, begin to understand how, besides of it being a killing machine, uh, how environmentally damaging mm. the military industrial complex is. So I, I fully understand, or I try to understand what you're saying, uh, that there is no clear cut division. Mm. So when you look at um, this quote, and <laughs> yes, we have it already here in the chat, of course, powerful quote. Thank you, Ian, for your service to us all. Uh, ba, ba, ba. So we, you can see it. Um, so if we look at that quote that you say, in a way, um, I read it to you again, in Quaker terms, I hope I've lived adventurally enough to speak a small amount of truth to power and that my body stopped certain things from happening. Um, I have found that with other Quakers, and I was especially um, really taken aback uh, by what they did in, in Gaza, and that was quite a while ago and that they seem to come from a oh it's almost humble you know but a kind of very convinced and convicted and enduring stance do do you feel that you being a quaker that that influences what you do and how you do it i think i'm lucky that in kind of six years I've soaked some of it up so it now becomes second nature I don't have to think what is a quakely way to respond to this um and you know one or two people in the past have said that I have a kind of solid and grounding presence on actions and I think in part that comes around having compassion for everyone who's involved 
I know the whole exile thing about liking the police is problematic um, in many ways, but you know, there's another Quaker saying, you know, there's something of God in everybody, mm. um, which is why, you know, in Palestine, they do the ecumenical company program and they work with both sides. It's not a pro-Palestinian thing or an anti-Israeli thing. Mm. It's, it's to understand the position of both parties and hopefully facilitate some dialogue between the two. Um, they would, they also do, um, uh, they run a program in Europe as well from Brussels. Um, and a lot of what I think I understand it's about is to be able to get people who can't officially speak together in meetings to, to, to start dialogues. Uh, yeah. You know, and lay the ground that these people can kind of meet and discover what their common ground is when, you know, kind of officially, politically and media wise, they're completely poles apart and diametrically opposed mm. so mm. to me that's what the quaker approach is about um and it comes into play as well particularly in the court process yes yes and of course this is something you become rather than having to think about when you said there is a that people sometimes say you are a solid presence or a calming presence within action so uh it's something you 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 become over time rather than right. saying yeah this is my approach yeah i don't think it's just to do with being a quaker but that's certainly part of it um being somewhat older also helps um Yes. And I've, you know, having lower <laughs> yeah, testosterone I levels than I did myself. 20 years yeah. ago. Mm. Um, that helps. Um, yeah. And the other thing, you know, particularly where actions are concerned, you know, years and years ago, I was a territorial army infantry soldier. So I've kind of got an interesting mix of experience. Yeah. Um, you know, I never saw active service because I was a reservist, but you know, we had the training to kind of run towards danger, as it were. Um, and it's, you know, that also gave me uh, another facet of, or another perspective on kind of peace, peace work and militarism and, and how it dovetails, having kind of been in at the other end, as it were. Yeah. And I've done a little bit, a little bit of work in the past with uh, Veterans for Peace, which is you know, explicitly for ex-service people uh, who are interested in the peace movement. Some people kind of think it's contradictory and that if you've ever been in the services, you couldn't possibly be a Quaker. But, you know, the idea is that all people can learn and develop. Oh, absolutely. And I wouldn't see it as contradictory. And in, in the opposite almost, well, not the opposite, but it makes for... A, we, no, let me come in this way. We had Ben Bowler here uh, this morning, who's the f one of the co-founders of uh, Unity Earth, which is quite a big organization bringing in uh, absolutely uh, anything and everything, because they see themselves as, as this container and trying to uh, support a lot of grassroots organizations. And it was astonishing how many different facets he had you know, that he had kind of traveled here, there, uh, um, worked, set something up with Muslims, set something up with Buddhists, set something. And you could hear it that is actually makes for a, an open and fairly, uh, yeah, a, a wide spectrum of a person. And so I think for me there is no contradiction in a way because all of it in the end uh, makes us what we are no? because it is a journey so uh, i can uh, hear that that in a way having seen the other side of it all um, and then being involved with uh, veterans for peace and then being there and there and it, it makes for a, 
Yeah, I don't mm. want to say a personality spectrum, but it makes for adepts. It, it, it brings in some depths into it because you understand uh, the different sides. And, and I find it interesting that you said for you as a Quaker, but I don't think it's just for the Quakers. Uh, Buddhists would say that there is a Buddha in everybody and all the mm. rest is kind of layer upon layer around it. But if we can keep it in mind that there is somebody in there somewhere, an essence, which is positive, which is, to use that word, is that kind of how you would see it or what you would subscribe to? I think that the common ground is probably compassion. Um, you know, prior to arriving at Quakerism, I was strongly influenced by Thich Nhat Hanh. Yeah, yeah. And Vietnamese Zen Buddhism. Um, and I always remember trying to bear in mind what he said that, you know, anyone you're having a problem with, you know, imagine if your life had been the same as theirs up to this point, and would you be any different? And to sit with that, mm. you know. Um, and you think, yeah, if, you know, things could very easily have been a bit different. Very easily. Oh, yeah. So is and that's in a way ties in, doesn't it? I mean, it's these these wisdom teachings from all sides, or call them what you want to call them. It reminds me on you should walk in somebody's moccasins for a while mm. first before you judge. And if you have walked in that person's moccasins for a while, mm. uh, you will understand that this person is how this person is because of the past they walked and what has happened to them and what's going on so so compassion is a big one isn't it it's it's interesting because it's also a buddhist concept of course isn't it mm. and uh, i mean as i understand mystic traditions i think they're certainly they Quakerism is almost, you know, the UK's kind of indigenous mystic tradition. Mm. Um, and it, it, it's just culturally, more culturally relatable to me than Buddhism is. Mm. Mm. You know, given what it's grounded in. What, um, is, it, what is it grounded in? Elaborate for a moment. <laughs> in this, on these aisles, is that what you're saying? Or on... Well, yeah, Quakerism is, it, it did arise in the UK. Um, I mean, it was around the time of the English Civil War when, uh, you know, there was a great turmoil in the UK or England as it was. Then, um, and it sprung up at a, at a similar sort of time to a lot of other extremely Protestant um, kind of traditions, the Digglers and the Levellers notably yeah. you know kind of so kind of religious stroke social movements although they probably may not have been seen the same um so it was a time of great kind of stress in the uk i think um and it was an attempt to simplify it and almost to kind of remove the patriarchy <laughs> you know <laughs> sorry <laughs> You know, uh, early Quakers were uh, assaulted for uh, disrupting sermons in churches. You know, yeah. that was something that George Fox did and was physically assaulted. Mm. Um, you know, trying to, you know, speak in truth to power, as it were. Um, but so there's a lot to it. But for me, the, the whole compassion thing is what fed in a great deal to the trial and court process that we underwent right okay go for it <laughs> well the how do we talk, how do we say this i think in the what i've noticed within xr is that a lot of people are very um they're prepared to submit to the police but in court people have been less willing to submit to the rest of the process i can feel people bridling against it um and something a couple of us did in the shell process 
was to adopt what we call a you know radical honesty and put things on the table in the court even if they were the kind of things that the the, the, the legal team would have said don't do mm. we decided the jury should have kind of all the facts about us um and i was particularly trying to hold a compassionate attitude towards the judge and the prosecutor because i think there's a very common thing to start seeing them as some kind of enemy but if we were volunteering to submit to the process the process only works with those people in place and enroll so they have to be there you know we need them yeah. Yeah. for this process yeah. to work therefore it's worth finding trying to find compassion and understanding for their position mm. and the pressures they're under um you know i i i learned sort of subsequently that uh, dr king called this fidelity to the law it, so it was about fully submitting to the entire process so kind of non-violent direct action it's not just about the street stuff it's also about being kind of non-violent in your kind of attitudes um once you're further into the the legal process you know i think it's important to see that this is a, a long process it's not just doing actions it's it's and it needs this complete flip doing actions is is quite assertive and sometimes risky um and doing the crown court process is very um kind of intense but in a different way it's much more deliberative mm. and it's mm. it's hard then to try and maintain those qualities as you go through it's a bit like going through hot and cold water or something that was would have been now my next question and i will ask you that even i guess it's difficult to answer so how do you kind of keep those qualities with difficulty um easy now say again sorry it can't be easy no Tate, it is with 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 difficulty um sometimes um but you know a lot of quakerism can be boiled down to some kind of cliches and that the quote you used was something where i had to kind of compress about three elements which i'd referred to in my defense statement in court into my summary which is why it's almost too curt and compressed i um, i understood that because i read the article and i knew that yeah. it came out from that but it's still it's a very good quote to kickstart something off when i when i see it in isolation it kind of makes my toes curl a little bit um but I think another key idea within Quakerism is that most things, you know, like the, so take for instance the idea of peace. It's not an outcome. There's not a Shangri-La on Earth where there's peace. Of course not. Peace is a peace is a process, not an outcome. Every day you have to work towards peace and away from violence and injustice. Um, so there's never a time that you can kind of stop doing that work because even if you achieve it, you've got to maintain it. Um, so it's all about process um, and uh, trying to see the court work in terms of process rather than we get to an outcome, we win or we lose. I found it was really important to, um, you know, engage with the process in the moment, if you like, mm, mm. and not have a thing, you know, we need to win this or we need mm. to do somebody down or, mm. you know, trample an argument um, we were very keen to you know speak our own truths um, and be open about that and to acknowledge that you know for some of us some of those things were a little bit contradictory but to treat it as a process so in a way what you're saying so you spoke your own truth and then in a way you had to to do that completely and engage with the process and accept the process because you knew you would get if you would get arrested you would have to go to court 
so in no, a way that is already known isn't it so you so there is a, a pre-acceptance but to keep that acceptance and then to go with the process and to say i'm speaking my truth mm. no matter of the outcome is this is what you're saying so you're not fixated on i want to win here or no i think i think one thing we managed to transmit to the jury is that we weren't trying to kind of save ourselves you know i was specifically careful not to ask the jury for a specific verdict yeah but to ask them to speak their truth i think the common thing is to say you know you must acquit me because and i felt that that wasn't quite the right approach for me that we need to just lay the facts out and what do they make and possibly you know we had overstepped the mark because all this works experimental i mean yeah. we talk about the court process but you know there'd been one xr crown court trial before this which i'd sat in on so there's almost nothing to go on in terms of experience or what's required mm. So it's a case, and I try and offer people counsel around this if I'm doing court support work, but you, you have to kind of enter it and remain fluid, mm. not with, I'm going to deliver this speech come what may, or I'm going to say my piece. Sometimes there's a time to, to assert or to push, and sometimes there's a time, there's a, a, a need to acquiesce. And it's becoming, it's, it's, for me, it's about learning to become sensitive to that. Yeah. And that is very, different from legal advice you get yeah of course Where obviously obviously it's effectively your your game in the scenario you have to get things in my advantage things not in my advantage forefront these minimize those um, um so what we're doing is kind is or what we were doing was is in some ways counterintuitive yes of course because i mean you said you 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 went with the process and no you um accepted the system yeah that this mm -hmm. this would happen you get arrested mm -hmm. you go to court but of course what you did do didn't do is accept the next step that a court case is usually all about trying to prove you innocent within the framework of the law and that's what your lawyers tell you yeah so mm -hmm. this we admit and this we don't and here we, we 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 can tune it down and don't say this and what you did i mean it's, it's fascinating you decided to speak your truth as you see it and then leave it up to the jury that Within, that was that was my approach we were also actually fortunate in the fact that there was this brief window where no legal defense existed right yeah because yeah. subsequent to the ziegler judgment from the supreme court things had changed i have another trial starting in a week's time i, I wanted to and now you. technically the legal team think we've got quite a strong legal defense on i think articles 9 and 10 of the european human rights act because Ziegler has said they carry some weight and they may carry some weight in courts other than magistrates' courts and for offences other than sitting in the road. Right, yeah. So this is, so this is kind of as Judge Perrins put it um, at the Home Office Lawn Diggers trial, that, you know, this is a new and developing area of law. Mm, of course, and it, but it, it at, will at, more and more develop, yeah. But at the time when we were there, you need to make this legal argument. Um, you know, and that, so every trial since then has been, has, is, is, has been or is becoming different because the legal landscape's changing. Yeah. And so, that legal landscape is developing, isn't it? And that is mm. partly because of the, well, to a good extent, because of the direct action of XR. Mm. Because that, that landscape has to develop and not always in, in, a, in a good direction. But yes, no, I understand that. So, so now you can, in a way, and maybe have to, 
uh, go more with what you can go with and uh, within these laws develop which are developing while you were of course in there at a time when there was a vacuum a bit is that what you're saying or to a certain extent yeah and it's 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 also a case of trying to be sensitive to what's you know what's needed um obviously developing the law in some way you know is a is a i don't know if it's an aim in itself you know some would say it's just more reformism um yeah given it's the you know the the kind of universe that we're working in at the moment it would seem useful if it if, if it can be reformed through you know case law and appeals mm. Maybe to an extent, I've, I, well, we, this is, I think, is, is going in a direction where we just need to see what the process brings. But what um, somebody said here in the chat, and I want to say that uh, you come across uh, very authentic, your authenticity, Ian, and that of the, is a real learning and inspirational. Do you feel that that is something you try to do to be as authentic as you can? To just be you? <laughs> is that too big a question? I think it's one of those things, you know, if you think you want to be an elder or you want to offer integrity, you've lost the plot at the outset. Right. Um, I think it's partly helped for me. Um, because I've always liked to simplify things. Um, I'm kind of not good at mental games and, you know, holding competing truths, or I have to be kind of simple and straightforward because of the way my mind works. And I would kind of say I'm probably on the autistic spectrum. So all of these things are, can sometimes, you know, sometimes they can make your life awkward people find you difficult but equally they kind of know where they are with you yeah yeah because you're straight forward yeah. and yeah. i think quakers like so many things tend to um attract or filter down to specific neurotypes people of specific neurotypes so i think quakers generally tend to be more introvert by and large, I would say that's only a seat of the pants judgment, but mm. you know, that's why I'd rather be here in conversation with you than just delivering a piece because there's I'm never going to be able to come kind of public intellectual or pundit. Um, mm. My brain just does not work like that. So it kind of brings something else in, you know, to the mix. And I think that's one of the strengths of rising up. You know, all the co-founders were kind of active within rising up campaigns. Yeah. And was the fact that, you know, we weren't all, you know, we had an array of different skills and, and attributes rather than all being very similarly minded. It's, it's kind of weird. We got chucked together. Mm. And in the early days of XR, I think a lot of the working groups were like that. And then they slowly started to you know, distill out and become groups of more like-minded people. You know, for one reason or another, they would start some kind of filtering or distillation process went on. And then we lost that kind of wonderful diversity. Yeah. This diversity uh, of neurotypes. Yeah. Which is, of course, yeah. But it, it, hey, it is a general thing in groups now because there is, there mm. is a, you know, deep within us, there is. <laughs> Somebody said to me once, if you want creativity within a group, don't look into a mirror. Meaning, mm. basically, have a lot of very different people in there. Don't look in, don't search for somebody you can look at and it's a mirror. Having said that, it is, of course, so much easier in a way, isn't it? Because there's also a, something 
about us which wants that reflection which wants to be reflected in the others so i think that is always a, a kind of a you know that's always a balancing act that will always go on in groups i i can't see xr there being that different yeah i often i often kind of say jokingly but with some seriousness you know my definition of hell is to be in a room with like-minded folk yeah. So many people say, I'd love to be in a room with like-minded people. Uh, <laughs> but to me, that's just a recipe for kind of group think. And it's, it's a recipe for kind of low friction and simplicity. But it's also, you know, a, a, you know, confirmation bias kind of hotbed and group. We lost you. Has your battery stopped? Sorry, everybody. We seem to have lost the thing. Yeah. Hot bed. Oh, there he is. Yes. We lost. Sorry, I just had an incoming call. It's interrupting my internet. We I had an incoming call. It's interrupting my internet. Ah, okay. So we couldn't hear what you said the last thirty seconds, and I don't know if you remember it. <laughs> right. Well, I was just saying that. Say, my idea of uh, hell is to be in a, a yeah. room full of like-minded people. Um, yeah. You know, because of the 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 tendency for that to lead to kind of group think and back slap in and i think that's probably why i found a home with the quakers because there's an old joke that if you put two quakers together you'll end up with three opinions <laughs> i like that one and it's funny somebody said in the stream here that the time she met quakers she always felt they were very tolerant is, is that a word you would use that they just it's somewhere further up in the stream non-judgmental she said ah uh, okay <laughs> Maybe. well there's it's, it's tricky because it's what quakerism is really about is discernment um and it's trying to understand things in a deep way and see what is required and sometimes that's tolerance and other times it is to, as they say, speak truth to power, which is not tolerating not tolerant, misbehavior. Yeah. Um, so it has its place. Um, you know, there is a, a another idea in Quakers, which, which they call kind of plain speech, which is to speak simply and without embroidery about mm -hmm. what needs to be said rather than the kind of courtly political speech where you kind of tell someone you know kind of a passive aggressive type approach it's easy to be, be more direct and possibly slightly uh confrontational yeah you know the kind of this this is the whole thing with non-violence that it, you know it's sometimes confused with passivism as opposed to pacifism mm. you know being passive um whereas actually you know there is a need for confrontational non-violence mm. yeah the part of that quote actually um about putting our bodies in the in the cogs of the machine comes from Bayard rustin yeah who who was dr king's kind of campaign manager strategic organizer he did a lot of stuff behind the scenes um yeah and um so he was quite inspirational, which is why I kind of mentioned him in my evidence. Um, you know, that people who've lived through harder times than I have to be a, you know, black gay man in the 1940s can't have been easy. And to be a pacifist and refuse the draft and then go to jail for three years must have been even more difficult. Mm. Um, so, yeah, and I think most qualities are kind of aspirational, but you'll kind of not achieve them. Mm. You know, because I have my character failings like everybody else and plenty yeah. of them. Yeah, <clears throat> but but hey, I, I mean, this is something where unfortunately you, you are looking in the mirror right now. Um, and I am on your wavelengths there because it is you said two words i mean the one is aspirational and the other one is process mm. and um you know we, we we are trying to um put ultimate statements out there 
for forgetting actually that everything is in a way a process and everything mm. is aspirational i i want to be a certain person but that's an aspiration and most of the time no all of the time you never get there because then you have to move your aspiration again because once you're there you 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 finish that is it mm. we are uh people in the making i want to come back to something or oh, somebody loves the idea that if you get two quakers you get three opinions <laughs> yes <laughs> okay <laughs> I can't want to come back to the court case, Ian, because one thing that struck me and it hasn't left me, I can't quote you because I didn't write it down. But when we had a chat on the phone, <laughs> you said that everybody was elated. Yeah, the other six people were really elated when they came out of the courtroom and they were all happy. And you weren't quite there. You had quite a lot running through your mind. And I don't remember precisely what you said, but I remember it struck me at the time and, and I was thinking about that afterwards. Do you remember what you said? I mean, you should, because you went through the experience. <laughs> yeah, to an extent, I, I, there were two of us. There was me and Simon Bramwell. Oh um, yeah, and Simon, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And you'll see there's that famous picture that they used in the FT of this of, of six of us who actually were in court that day. Um, four of them looking elated and jumping up and down and two of us with their hands in the pockets like some kind of surly rock band kind of picture. Yeah. Um, and everyone asked, what was that all about? Um, and, you know, it's about an acknowledgement of reality, really, you know, shell you know to celebrate and moving from the netherlands to the uk because this is a you know a lax regulatory environment now relative to the netherlands um yeah. and they're moving their headquarters here um you know i knew we get asked kind of what does it mean um and reflecting on your your own actions with no historical perspective i think is kind of a fool's errand you know it might mean mean something in 20 years or it might be the very smallest footnote um and the other thing was you know i had gone through i did try and treat the entire trial as a kind of a spiritual process um you know and to do it as a kind of act of worship and to kind of uphold people in the courtroom which is why it was exhausting um and yeah and then, then to you know everyone you come out and everyone's so desperate for good news they're going you won and it's not about winning or losing it's profoundly not it was the jury that we were lucky to came up with you know made a judgment or expressed an opinion and for that i'm grateful so it's not a win it's more a maybe this wasn't completely a foolish thing to do because obviously it was experimental. Yeah. You know, at the time there were, when we did that action, there were no Crown Court trials teed up. Everything had been aimed at, at the street and the kind of, you know, obstruction of essentially the public, which was to some degree criticised and critiqued. And you know, we were keen to take it a little bit to address some of the corporate actors who are a big part of this mm. um, and sp explicitly to get into Crown Court because our experience, Simon and our experience in magistrates courts was always the, the black letter of the law with its very small scope says you're guilty and thus you are. Yeah, um, yeah. Whereas, you know, a jury are one of the few places where ordinary you know, people off the Clapham omnibus are actually empowered to make a significant decision. Yeah. And of course, that was exactly why the jubilation was going on so much, no? that normal people in a jury, mm. jury uh, didn't completely uh, go with the letter of the law. Mm. 
and said, these people, these seven people, you know, uh, yes, they broke the law, but they are not guilty. Mm. And I think that was the elation. But I can hear what you're saying um, to an extent that there was luck involved, that you had a good jury. There was maybe your truth speaking involved. There was maybe uh, other bits involved that it was an on the edge, an edge case. But what interests me, and, and definitely because we are within this environment, is that you said you tried to see the whole court process as a spiritual process. And I think everybody will be interested in that because then we are coming to an end. Because, But this is about sacred earth activism in a way. And, and to hear it so clearly combined, even within a court uh, environment. Uh, tell me a bit more about that. And then hopefully we'll bring two or three questions in if we still have time. Well, this, this was something I kind of evolved as we got into the process. You know, it's like, how do I see and respond to this and what's required of me? You know, for me, the whole, you know, the, 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 the kind of bedrock of spirituality is about getting over your own individuality. And it's, you know, what is required here and now and it's not yes. to win this process but it's to engage in it in a kind of truthful way and try and ex embody and rather than express kind of embody those values of kind of compassion and things which is not always difficult uh, not always easy sorry not always easy yeah yeah um so it's a case of then sitting with something whilst you're going through the process. Mm. So in a way, it's almost like doing a kind of guided meditation, you know, where there's kind of interruptions at certain points. <laughs> which, is, put, which is the judge and, 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 and lawyers, yeah. Yeah, that puts something new into it. Mm. And then how do you, how do you kind of absorb and fit around that? Yeah, yeah. It's weird because I, I, I often I come off and joke, you know, say I can't show the working out. I'm quite kind of intuitive and um, habitually experimental. You know, when you do all the site, all the sort of kind of psychological testing. Yeah. I have a really strange learning style that's very, very experimental. I'm not very. That's why I'm not a very good listener. Um. And that's exactly what i was doing and it almost freed us up actually that the, the lawyers kind of said we we have to withdraw here because there's no argument we can make um i was actually quite happy to sit there and and let them do their stuff in court so we were then presented with this kind of slightly absurd scenario of having you know no legal defense and i think that made the jury see things differently and it allowed us i think to you know if you like labor the point that this was a court of morality rather than a court of law yes and obviously yes. the uk doesn't you have that, courts of you? morality yeah. no yeah. Um, and i'd heard another one of my friends from christian climate action she'd said that had this conversation with a magistrate you know the magistrate saying you know to her you're saying this essentially this should be a court of morality not a court of law and she said yes i suppose i am um and that that little um sort of anecdote was or that little vignette was really um just one of those little things where you suddenly learn something and take it in yeah and i realized that that was almost what we needed to do and we'd been gifted this opportunity yes yes i'm fully of course the little sad aspect is that there is obviously a big difference between a court of law and morality. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to even say that. Otherwise, this would come together. But I mm. I remember 
there's a very famous court case during I think it was during um, Martin Luther King times or later, I don't remember precisely uh, where exactly this was said. They self-defended and it was all about a moral stance they were taking, their own mm. moral stance. And they constantly, in a way, uh, uh, almost said, you know, that it is actually uh, a set uh, state in a society when morality mm. and the law are so far apart mm. and i think this is this is great what you said there this 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 kind of that you that it was about morality and about your beliefs wasn't it it was about what shell is doing is basically hugely destructive to humanity and all the rest of life yeah, and and I think, you know, metaphorically, we were putting our necks on the block and handing the jury the axe and saying, do what you think is right. Think right. And I think it's that preparedness. And, and, you know, obviously, in retrospect, seeing what the same judge sentenced James Brown to. Yes, yes. You know, it's made me realise retrospectively, we had our head further into the lion's mouth than we thought at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know so we were lucky but it's it's the i think it's the kind of the absurdity part of it you know it's, it's, you know it's like it makes people question you know why are these people in a court of law with no legal defense and still pleading not guilty any sane person would plead guilty and get a third off their sentence yeah. you know and i think that's the way the system will play was playing it yep of course, and that's it, the way the system plays, because it then tells you, yes, you are agreeing to the system if you play mm, that game, and you. Mm, so there is this fidelity to the law and submitting to the process, but there is also the allowing it to, you know, illustrate to itself its own violence and its own kind of internal contradictions. Yeah, absolutely. And its wow. lack of integration with, say, ethics and... and yeah ethics and matter. morals and truth yeah absolutely no I'm, I'm 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 fascinated and i think we could go on another hour shock horror <laughs> to you <laughs> um so i think we leave it at that partly because actually uh we are running out of time believe it or not it's uh five minutes to three is it yeah and the next, mm -hmm. uh, Mumta, I don't know if you know Mumta Ito, she's the uh, uh, rights of nature lawyer, she's coming in, uh, and I don't want to, we don't want to le let her leave her waiting, but is there something you want to say before I give a big thank you and a virtual hug to you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks for listening to my um, kind of goings on because I find I only work a lot of these things out in my own head in conversation. Mm. That's another thing I found is that actually it really uh, developing any of this stuff is a collaborative thing. I don't go away and sit down with a book and come back with an idea. Yeah. It Most develops lit lit literally through interaction with people. Yeah. I find that as well and and it's I think this is something really which we all need to learn you know as you as you said before groups you know we work best and we are most creative in communities but then they also produce most of the problems because it's human beings interacting now and and so I'm just reading one or two things to you uh, which I said here so interesting thank you very much Thank you. Hi, Ian. I really appreciate you coming and being interviewed and hearing your perspectives and wisdom. There you go. Go away. You are wise. You're too wise for this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you see, this, you can't take it. <laughs> God, I, I, can, I, I, can, I can feel the upholding, to, to, to use a Quaker term. You know, we talk about <laughs> upholding other people in their work, and I can yeah. feel in the com from the chat there that i'm kind of being upheld in this in this environment so thank you everybody you are at this moment in time you are and and enjoy it enjoy it thank you ever so much ian and um stick around if you want to 
you have another court case coming next week i know um mm -hmm. so well what do you say with court cases good luck or break a leg or what do you do <laughs> Uh, my favourite saying is the uh, French Canadian one, "Bon courage." Okay. Good bon heart. courage to you. Bon courage. Thank yeah. you everybody else, thank you ever so much, Ian. It was a pleasure, <laughs> and I've been in touch, touch with you. Thank you. Thank you Ian, very much, everybody.